Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our webinar today, Capital Campaigning in a Digital Era. Before we get started, I just want to go over a few housekeeping items, so all callers will be muted. If you have questions, feel free to use the chat box that you see on the left-hand side of your screen. If you have to drop off early um, or you get disconnected, we will be posting the webinar on our website at techsoup.org slash community slash events dash webinars. We'll also be sending an email once the webinar is over with the presentation, the recording, and any relevant links. If you're on social media, feel free to tweet at us at TechSoup using hashtag TSWebinars. Um, but like I said earlier, we will be using the chat box that you see on the left-hand side of your screen. So just a little bit about TechSoup before we get started. We are located in 236 countries and territories, and we serve over a million nonprofits uh, bringing discounted um, or donated hardware and software. We work with several technology companies like Adobe, Intuit, Microsoft, Symantec, and um, several others that you see here. So if you're interested in finding out if your nonprofit is eligible to receive our um, discounted or donated donations, uh, please see the link that my colleague Stephen will be placing in the chat box on the left-hand side um, of your screen. All right, so before I make introductions, I wanted to make sure that you guys can hear me okay. So if you don't mind just chatting in where you're calling in from, and I'll read out a few of them. All right, so we have Michael from Colorado, Lynn from Arizona, Jackie from California, all right, Tina from Pennsylvania, awesome. Okay, so it seems like you guys can hear me okay. Perfect. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and make introductions. So my name is Seema Tucker, and I'm the Senior Manager of Content here at TechSoup. Uh, my colleague Stephen Davidson, he is assisting with chat on the back end, and he is the Marketing Associate here at TechSoup. And today's main presenter is Moshe Hecht. And Moshe is the Chief Innovation Officer at Charity. Moshe was the winner of the 2017 Nonprofit Pro Technology Professional of the Year. Uh, he is also a philanthropy futurist, public speech speaker, and Chief Innovation Officer of Charity, a crowdfunding platform and consulting company that has helped uh, 3,000 organizations raise over $700 million. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to Moshe. Thank you, uh, Seema. Um, so just want to make sure we, uh, my slides are presenting here. Not moving to the next slide. Okay, so thank you everybody for joining us. My name is uh, Moshe Heck. I am the Chief Innovation Officer of Charity.com, as Seema mentioned. This is my third TechSoup webinar, so I'm excited to be here. And I uh, want to thank you everyone in advance for joining us today. So who is Charity? We are a crowdfunding platform and consultancy. We have um, – Seema read my bio, which is a little bit outdated, but we moved quick here at Charity, so I don't blame her. We have worked with over 5,000 organizations, raising over $900 million with a 99% success rate. Our uh, main focus is on giving day crowdfunding campaigns, and then we also do uh, campaigns or capital campaigns, peer-to-peer -peer campaigns as well. And you are all invited to our billion-dollar party that is coming up in the next uh, few weeks. Okay. So the title of this uh, webinar is Capital Campaigning in a Digital Modern Millennial Era. Okay. And what I wanted to do is shed some light on a system and a modality that has more or less been in place for 100 years without any real disruption, without any real innovation. Now, that's to say that people are doing um, innovative things, obviously, and doing disruptive things and doing grand, beautiful, you know, grandiose things. But in terms of the planning and the strategic um, uh, methodology for doing a capital campaign, much has changed in this digital uber-connected era that we live in right now. And what I wanted to, to present is, let's call it an alternative to the classic fundraising methodology for capital campaign. Now, before we go into that, um, into detail, I'd like to first just get um, some grounding here. And 
what do we mean when we talk about capital campaign? So I like to break it up into four different categories. The first category is this building on the right is simply when an organization is reaches an opportunity to expand, to start, uh, to grow, um, to start a new organization within the within the umbrella, and they need that real estate to buy, a, to purchase, or to build a building. That is the most obvious capital campaign um, category. Now, the second category down here in the middle on the bottom right, on the bottom right, is if it's not necessarily a building, but it's, let's say, a smaller capital raise. Let's say I put over here a, um, a playground. So if you're a day school, if you're a community center, and you wanted to raise $100,000, $200,000, $300,000 for a particular uh, piece of uh, uh, equipment or real estate or, a, you know, in this case, a playground for your organization, that is also considered a capital raise. Um, number three, all the way on the left over here, is property. So if you are a camp and you're buying a campground, if you are an organization and you're buying a property next door to you to build a parking lot, to build a new building eventually, if you're building, if you're buying the property for even for long-term investment purposes as well, that is the third uh, category. And then finally, the fourth category is actually probably the most overlooked category and people don't typically think about as a capital raise, but this is actually capital raise. And let me give you an example of what this fourth category here is. So if you're, let's say, for example, a day school and you um, are an elementary school and you, you service grades, you know, pre-1A through till eighth grade, okay? And then one day you decided that because this is an incredible need and this incredible uh, busting at the seams and the, your, your graduates are going into eighth grade and there isn't a suitable high school in the community, you decided we want to now open a high school, okay? That is also a capital raise. Now, it's important to differentiate that with, you know, starting a new program, right? If this elementary wanted to start a new volunteer program for their students, which is an additional program, that's not a capital raise. That's just expanding your annual um, fundraising. It's expanding your budget. What we're talking about is doing something that's almost like this one-time cost. It's this additional cost above and beyond your annual fundraising and above and beyond your annual fundraising growth strategy that is going to take a nice chunk of money within a concentrated amount of time um, that is above and beyond your annual fundraising, that is what we consider to be capital raising. So when we talk about capital campaigns, we're talking about these four categories, purchase of a, of a building, the building of a building, a purchase of something smaller like a playground, property, or a, um, a new initiative in your organization that is above and beyond just simply a new program for your organization. Okay, so what I'm going to present to you uh, now is a sample case of a classic capital campaign roadmap and strategy. Now, I want to be very, very clear. What I'm going to do is present to you a sample campaign. This does not mean that every single capital campaign needs to follow exactly these steps. And I'm going to propose an alternative to this sample campaign and that also means that the alternative that I'm presenting to you is not either a one-size-fits-all you know, one alternative, but it is a possible alternative based on the new uh, opportunities that we live in today. And what I'd like for you guys to is you know, open your imagination and say, well, this is just a storyline. This is one case. How can I apply the philosophy from this storyline? How can I apply the, um, the things that I'm learning, the reasons behind this alternative methodology to my capital campaign? Now, so this is relevant if you, are, if you are embarking now on a new capital campaign. It's relevant even if you are in the middle of a, 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 a capital uh, campaign. You know, it's relevant if you know, you're dreaming about a capital campaign because every nonprofit at some point is going to be faced with a capital campaign raise. So let's start with this sample case. And this is what a classic um, um, 
roadmap would look like. This was actually invented by many different people collaboratively, but probably most famously by a man named Hank Grosso, who was one of the pioneers of, of fundraising strategy. And you can break this up into, some people break it up into four steps and six steps and ten steps, but I broke it up here into eight steps. I think that's um, um, just, just for clarity, I broke it up into a little bit more than, uh, than your classic steps. So the step one is the pre-campaign planning. So in your pre-campaign planning, what you're looking at is you're developing the concept of your capital campaign internally. Okay, so you're, this is just the very, very um, early stages of saying, hey, you know what? We really need a building for our, uh, for our work. Hey, you know what? You know, we have this building. Um, we really need to start expanding the property so that we can host more people in, a, in, a, in our building. And what, it's, what this pre-campaign planning, it's usually the dream, right? It's usually that, that, um, that broad understanding of what you want to do, okay? So maybe there's a property that's available for sale, right? Maybe you are searching for the thing. So you want to do is you want to write down, you want to prepare those pre-campaign planning steps, okay? Now, once you have a broad goal, right? So in this case, we're using a $10 million goal. We're saying like, ah, if we're going to want to purchase this building, we're probably going to need between all in, it's probably going to be about $10 million. Okay, and based on a few conversations that I've had with people that have done similar projects in the past, it's probably going to take us between five and ten year plan. That's your step one. Step two is being more precise on your capacity to raise said ten million dollars. And what an organization would typically do in this stage would do a feasibility study. Okay, and the feasibility study will be something that you know, there's a range, there's a broad range of how uh, broad this feasibility study could be. Now, you can do it as simply looking into your donor base, studying your, your donor history, studying your, um, you know, your donor base value, your social equity, if you've been around for five years, 10 years, 20 years. You can take it up a notch and you could um, and if, you're a, if you're a university, if you're a hospital, if you have a much greater capacity, you're doing a much greater goal, this feasibility study can actually be much more robust where you can look into the open opportunities within your community. Okay? And feasibility can start from creating questionnaires that you send out to as many people in the community as possible, prospective donors. A feasibility study can mean sitting down and having interviews with your local law firms, having interviews with your um, local, uh, you know, companies and corporations and saying, well, you know, we're thinking about, you know, purchasing this, uh, pr this property for this and this organization. Is this something that you would potentially give to? How much would you potentially give to, right? And you create this concentrated feasibility study where after uh, this study you have, you sort of, um, make those assumptions that you did in the pre-campaign planning and you, um, you confirm those assumptions through research and through this um, detailed study. And that typically can take between six to eight, to eight months in this case scenario. Step three is the campaign planning. So in your campaign planning, you're now taking your feasibility study and you're doing three things with that feasibility study. Number one, you're creating a goal. Okay, you're going to create a gift range of how many donors you're going to need at how many at at which level in order to create to, to, to reach that goal. Okay, and that's where the data of your feasibility study is going to become so important, and so necessary. The second plan, part of the campaign planning is the marketing and the messaging and the case statements for your campaign. So it doesn't necessarily need to be yet, you know, your taglines and your sublines and that perfect copy, but internally for your internal staff, for your board, and for some of those major donors, which you see we're going to get into step four, you need to create a case statement for your organization, but more importantly, you need to create a case statement for this capital campaign. Like, why do we need to buy this particular building? Why do we need this particular amount of money? What is it going to do if we have this, uh, this new property or this new um, capital um, uh, project? Okay, and finally, number three is you want to start getting your 
volunteers together, your key players involved, and that can be anywhere from your, you know, your um, your your staff to your board to your um, to volunteers in the community. It can even, it can be peer to peer. So there's a lot of uh, um, volunteers and making sure that okay, who are the key players for this campaign. Step four. Once you have all that ready, is the quiet stage of the fundraising. So, in a case of $10 million, your goal would be, in any ideal case scenario, any consultant would tell you, you want to get anywhere between 50 and 70 uh, percent of that funds raised before you go public. So, that's that quiet stage. What is that quiet stage? It is finding your leadership gift. So, who's going to take the name of this building? You want to find your major gift. Who's going to take a wing? Who's going to take, uh, you know, uh, 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 a part of the property who's going to take uh, part of, you know, going to name the library after them, or if it's a synagogue, it'll name, you know, name this, 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 this part of the property or this wing part of the property, right? So these are your major gifts. And you're going to them um, to solicit large gifts. Now, this stage of the process for a $10 million goal, I mean, it can take anywhere from six months, which is very unlikely, to like actually years of this quiet stage, and many quiet stages do go on for years and years. Okay, now, step, step five, going into campaign kickoff. So now that we have this seven, roughly seven million dollars, right? I would say if you had five, you potentially could go in. If you have eight, that's even better. But now that we're ready to, we have our, our, our case statement ready, we have our marketing campaign um, ready, we have our um, lead gifts, our major gifts, our mid-tier gifts, we then start to prepare for a public stage. And what that means is we need to then take our internal case statement and take that messaging that we brought to the major donors. How are we going to bring this now to the masses? How are we going to churn this communication to something that is more digestible, something that is more memorable, something that is more penetratable, something that is more sticky for a broader community? And that takes time to prepare. Finally, you go into this public stage where your goal would be, in this case, to raise $3 million, and that can take anywhere between three to six months, and that can be a combination of the email marketing campaign, a direct mail campaign, a series of events, you know, or posters everywhere out in, out in the community, advertising in newspapers, advertising in local stores. Um, so that can take a public stage where it's like you, know, you own the airwaves for an extended period of time. In this case, we're giving an example of three to six months. Finally, once you reach that goal of, of $10 million, you want to take time to celebrate with the community. You want to take time to thank everybody. Um, and sometimes that can be in the form of a beautiful letter, a private letter to their home. In addition to that, you can do an event. You can do a dinner. You can do a celebration. You can do anything that, makes, that says thank you to the major donors, and you can honor them. Or, and it says thank you to the mid-tier mid donors, and you can give them a nice gift, and you can say thank you to the modest donors and give them an experience. You can give them swag. You can invite them into the actual property that, 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 that you are doing and celebrate them. And number eight is that follow through. Just going through that data, make sure that everyone has their receipt, make sure that everyone knows what their payment plan is if people uh, made a pledge, make sure everyone gets a thank you, just that thorough follow through, which in this case we're giving three to six months for that um, to take place. Okay? So, um, this is your classic, let's call it old school methodology, and what I want to present is a new way. And this new way, and again, I want to make it clear, this is not a copy and paste model, like a model. This is how I would take the slide that I just showed you and how I would innovate and how I would tap into the opportunities that we have today. And I would, this is one sample of how I would change that to take this same 10 year plan, the same $10 million, and do it in two to three years. Now, this may not work for every single organization in every single scenario, but this is an actual plan that I've actually used with an organization, executed, and seen success from this exact uh, model. And you're going to see that the things that make this model possible 
are the things that you would, I would love for you to take away, the lessons that I'd love for you to learn from today. Now, let's first go into how are we going to do this. So the first thing that we want to do, and the third thing that we want to change is, instead of looking at this campaign as this upward trajectory like we just showed you, with this arrow going up where you're climbing this mountain, and this mountain can take years, right, of getting major donors, getting those leadership gifts, planning everything out, doing that quiet stage. What, I'm, what, what, what my methodology here is split it up, number one. Split it up into three bite-sized components. Year one, you're going to raise three, point, you know, three million plus, three and change, 3.3 and change. Year two, you're going to raise 3.3 and change. And year three, you're going to raise 3.3 and change. And in a full year, you will be able to take all of those eight steps and get that done in, the first, in, in, in one year. The first stage, which is a 10-month period, of a number one, you'll be able to get steps one through four, the pre-campaign planning, the feasibility study, the campaign planning and the quiet stage in 10 months, and then get that second, um, those, those, those five, six, seven, and eight, those stages in a two-month period of a campaign kickoff, public stage, celebration, and follow-through in just two months. If and when that part is successful, and we go through that entire um, roadmap in a bite size, well, 3 million, 3.3 is not such a small bite, but it's a portion of that, of that uh, campaign. We then repeat that in year two and year three. Now, how are we going to do this? What's this magic potion? What are we doing differently? Well, what we're doing differently is as follows. And then we're going to dissect how and why it actually works. What we're doing differently is we are involving the major donors that we are getting through to in the early stage in a culmination of a matching campaign that will culminate at the end of the two-month period. And every dollar that is given in these 10 months from the matching donors, in addition to it being a leadership gift, in addition to it being a major gift, it is also going to be a contingent gift for the public stage. It's going to be a contingent gift for those two months which are going to be the preparation for a giving day, which can literally take 24 hours, 36 hours, or 48 hours. Now, I know this is a, a lot to swallow right now, so I'm going to go through um, this step-by-step -step and explain to you how we're going to transition from this 5- to 10-year plan to this possible 2- or 3-year plan splitting it up. So let's take a step back for a second, okay? And let's study um, for a moment what it is that major donors are looking for when they are being asked to participate in a capital campaign and why it takes them so long to commit. Why does a quiet stage need to take years to get commitment? Now, I'm talking about above and beyond, um, well, they may, not, they may not have the funds right now, or they may not uh, be ready to commit um, to this right now, or they're just you know, uh, being introduced to the organization. I'm talking about engaged, um, knowledgeable, educated uh, uh, major donors who are in your sphere of organization, but they simply are not ready to make that commitment, and it takes them time to make a commitment. Now, the question is why? Why do we have to wait sometimes months or years for major donors to say, okay, I'm ready. I know I love your organization, but now I'm ready to make that major commitment. And the essential reason is as follows. Supply and demand, okay? You are going to a major donor and you're asking him to supply a leadership gift or a major gift of a very, very large sum, okay? And you have to make the case that there is actually a demand for this specific amount, this particular project, right? Now, you have to make a case for that. Now, that case comes in the form of, you know, breaking down the numbers, showing them the feasibility study, 
showing them the work and the track record that you have over the past few years, right? Developing uh, grant letters, all these things that you have to work on. But in essence, all of these things are very abstract. All of these things are pie in the sky. All of these things are as good as you can dream and as good as you can put together um, for this type of campaign. And what that does is there needs to be a certain level of faith from this major donor. There needs to be a certain level of, well, you know, I don't see it in front of me, but I'm going to give you this pledge for this major gift. And really, ultimately, I'm hoping that you're going to come through on this project. I really, and essentially, I'm hoping that this building will be filled with, with, with students. These buildings will be filled with, 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 with the homeless people. They'll be filled with, uh, you know, children or whatnot. Um, so it, it's that lack of understanding and the proof of this demand that takes them the, the, the length of time for them to be able to commit. Now, on the right side, what I'm showing to you is what if the demand can come before the supply? What if all of those doubts that a major donor has, all of those um, uncertainties that a major donor has, all of those things that are holding him back from saying in that first meeting or that second meeting saying, I am ready to give you a million dollars for this capital campaign. What if all of those doubts can be curbed and can be immediately um, uh, answered if you can put the demand before the supply? If you can tell him that, hey, one second, if I cannot prove to you that there is a true demand for this product, if there is a true demand for this in, this, in, in our community, then I'm not asking you for your supply. Now, what do you need for that to happen? You need a few things. Number one, you need to be able to use their gift as a contingent match for a giving day or for a giving week, by the way. It doesn't have to be a giving day. It can be a giving week. It can be a giving month. But what if you're using that as a contingent match for a campaign, for a giving day, okay? And again, I want to remind everybody that this is a sample case that I'm giving to you. This is not something that I'm saying that, you know, um, can be used in every single scenario. This is a sample case, and you're, by the end, of it, you'll hopefully you'll understand how you can use these, this philosophy and you can use these tools to apply in different ways. So what you're telling him is, what if, you don't have to imagine that there's a supply. What if I can prove to you that there is truly a demand before you even give your – now, what is one way to be able to put demand in front of the supply that only today in our generation we're able to do? The collective voice of the people, right? So there's nothing more powerful than the collective voice of the people. It's how we elect our you know, um, political officials. It's how – uh, we do so many things today is that we do surveys and we make decisions with data. What if we can tell this major donor that if we cannot get five, six, seven thousand, eight thousand, or on a smaller campaign, a hundred people to actually give and separate from their day-to-day -day check, fifty dollars, a hundred dollars, two hundred dollars, to participate for this particular thing, then you don't have to give your pledge. Then we're not. Then we are not going to hold you accountable for this. Um, for this. For, for for your for your money. And when you tell him, well, what's the greatest way to prove that there is a need for this? And that's the collective power of the people. If you have thousands of people who are going to come together and separate with their funds, nothing shows commitment more than funds. Nothing shows um, a community needing something when they come together and they give from their hard-earned, you know, um, people who are living check to check and they say, you know, I want this building. We need this building. Our organization is busting at the seams or we, can, you know, we can't stop renting places. We need a physical space. And people coming together to give on this public stage, on this giving day, to show the proof of concept. What that happens is if you can do that, you are proving two things. And you are changing the game for the, for the, for the major donor in two ways. Number one, you are giving him the ultimate leverage, okay? You're giving him the ultimate leverage that he needs to um, say, 
to make that decision to make that decision quicker, to make that decision faster, right? If you really think about it, someone who is of means, who's being asked for donations every single day, sometimes they're going to say yes right away. Sometimes it'll take them months. Sometimes it'll take them years. But the person who gives them, the organization that gives them the greatest leverage, those are the organizations that are going to get the quickest, fastest results. And if you're telling him that within this, and it can't be in three years or four years from now, that's the point. The quiet stage can't go on for years. It has to happen quickly. It has to be foreseeable, or it has to be around the corner. It has to be something that he can imagine now in this real time that he can, that his money is going to be um, matched, not only by the crowd, but also by other donors. So we're using all of these major donors of the quiet stage to be a match in this public stage. And it can either be a 2x match or a 3x match or a 4x match, depending how you want to split up those match and depending how you want to bundle it. Now, the second thing that can completely expedite their decision making on joining your, on joining your uh, capital campaign is efficiency. When you tell them that this is going to be, we're taking the first stage of this campaign and we're going to be raising $3.3 million in this first stage, and it will be complete, and it will be done, and it will allow us to, let's say, purchase the process plus start the construction, or it will allow us to, you know, do the construction on the first five floors, or it will allow us to get that loan from the bank, and then we can get a mortgage, and maybe it doesn't even have to take two or three years, it just take one year, right? You are showing him that you are operating at a next level efficiency, and that's what they want to see. So truncating the time is actually going to get you better results. It creates that sense of urgency. It creates that sense of efficiency. And it creates that sense of leverage that they need um, to say yes quicker, yes faster. So that is one way that in the private, quiet stage, you can take what would normally could take from six months to years, can take you, in this case, 10 months, okay? And by the way, feasibility study, you don't really need to do a feasibility study because you're going to have a contingent crowdfunding campaign that is going to tell you whether the people want this or they don't want this. So you're thinking, of course, well, there's risk involved. Well, yes, you need to do your feasibility study to the extent of the risk that you're taking, to the extent of studying your donor base and working with a, a proper uh, consulting team that says, well, if you get an average of increases by this amount, because it is a capital campaign, and people give more, and average gives in, then the chances of you reaching that goal are, you know, are much, are, are you know, X, perc X percentage. A lot of that, that, that elongated planning, which is all in the abstract, can be truncated into a much shorter amount of time by gaining that data, that collective data by people, by in the actual crowdfunding campaign um, that will give you the data that, look, people do want this project. So that can take a, a campaign, and I've seen this happen, ladies and gentlemen. I am working with organizations day in and day out that had an option. Do we spend the next six months doing a feasibility study that will give us abstract information, or do we do, we, do, we, do a basic feasibility study that says, this is how much money we need, this is how much money we, 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 we can raise. We go to the major donors, we tell them, listen, we want to take a part of this campaign, we want to do it quick, we want to do it fast, we want to do it in a way that's going to give you maximum leverage, maximum efficiency. Are you in? Okay. Now, what about the public stage? How do we get that public stage to be shorter than, than normal? Right? Public stages can take months to get the word out to the community. So why it works in under two months is actually the most exciting part about this whole thing. Right? So when we think about public stages and capital campaigns, we think about like these pictures. Right? The big building in front of the big thermometer, the classic thermometer. Oh, if you put up a thermometer, if you put up a progress bar, everybody's going to come running to, to fill up that progress bar. They just want to see that red line go higher and higher. Okay. Well, that's not good enough because the traffic of people who are walking in front of your building or seeing your flyers I think, is very low. Okay? So that's why public stages took forever. That's why they took so long. If you want to get the word out, 
um, to, to, to the people. It takes time. You've got to print those flyers. You've got to get, invite them to events. You have to um, get them to see the signs. You have to get put it, hear it on the radio. You have to read it in the newspapers, right? There's all this stuff that takes time to get the public agent. But ladies and gentlemen, we all know that that is not the case anymore. Okay, that is not the case. Today, a message, and we see it every single day, a message, and I don't want to use the word viral because, you know, there's, you know, it's, we're not looking necessarily to make this campaign go viral like the Ice Bucket Challenge or to create world virality, but yes, to have a viral element to it, to create a momentum and an inertia that goes way beyond any of those, you know, steps that I just mentioned that takes on a life of its own. And we can do that today. Today we live in a society, we live in a digital era, where if a plan properly executed, and in this case I'm giving you an example of two months preparation where we plan a Facebook campaign, an email campaign, a Twitter campaign, a call campaign, a WhatsApp campaign, a LinkedIn campaign, an Instagram campaign, and we line that all up and we do not release that information because we want it to have that compounded effect. We don't want to be you know, losing all our friends by asking them every single day, can you give, can you give, can you give, can you give. No. We want to concentrate all of that effort. We want to concentrate all the communication to, um, to a concentrated time. And it can, it can come in in a 24-hour campaign and a 48-hour but a week campaign. But enough of the campaign where you prepare this enough, the communication enough, and to influence just that it's so well prepared and it's so, I think, that it hits that tipping point. And it hits that tipping point where that entire message that would classically take sometimes weeks, if not months, if not years, it can happen literally in a day. Literally in two days, the word, the word can get out. And, you know, couple that with the fact that their money is going to be matched on this campaign coupled with the fact that they see that they're not just giving a loan, but they're partnering with these major donors from this quiet stage, coupled with the fact that they'll be able to actually get a part of this done, if not the whole thing done in other scenarios, but in this scenario, be able to move into the building or be able to buy that property. It's a tangible goal that they'll be able to really bite their teeth into and help reach that tangible goal. That then takes a public stage that can take years, months, if not years, to basically taking actually a day or two with two months of preparation. Now, that is um, the one case scenario. And, and this can be applied in many different ways. You want to think about how you can put supply before the demand. I'm sorry, how you can put the demand before the the, the, the um, um, the, the, to show the demand before the supply. That can be done with the matching gift. That can be done with collective data from, from, from real-time data from the organizations, which can be collected so instantly uh, today. That can be done, and I'm going to show you some other creative ways that we can, um, that we can expedite that process. It, we want to think about um, the le leverage. How are we going to use that quiet stage and not make it a quiet stage? Make it actually like a, like, a, like a quiet public stage, let's call it, where it's not we're, we're reaching the major donors in isolation, but we're actually, actually empowering the major donors to be the seed investors to encourage the next generation of givers, to encourage the millennials to give, to use their funds as a matching gift, or to use their funds and publicize their funds to inspire other, uh, other uh, donors to give. And to do that in an efficient way. And efficiency can be applied in many different ways. But I'm bringing in a case over here, efficiency can be applied in a way where you cut down the time. Cut down the time. Because you can do that today. Today, with all the things that I just mentioned, you can actually cut down the time. Now, some practical things I'm going to bring over here of how we could um, actually do this. Because again, guys, this is like a, a, this is a big, um, you know, I'm, I'm throwing you guys a, a big curveball here. And there's this, this is, we're, we're in our infant stage of the possibilities of the things that I just mentioned. Um, so what are some practical things that we can do? So one of the things that I, that I, one example I can give you is like, is like this. Yeah, VR goggles. Everyone's talking about VR goggles, right? But who's actually putting them on? But I want to give you an example where we actually use VR goggles. 
So we did a capital campaign with an organization that was looking to purchase a campground. Okay, several million dollar purchase. Now, we had, you know, classical option of creating renderings and creating a physical, a physical, a physical um, rendering of it, creating a book, and that takes time. That takes writers. That takes graphic artists. That takes renderers. That takes, um, you know, putting together the numbers. We decided, you know what? Let's cut all of that out. Let's cut all of that planning. Let's go down to the campgrounds. Let's take a 3D video of the campground. Let's the person, we, and we have the executive director and the director of development and the head of marketing walking through the campground, giving a tour of the campgrounds. What better way to say what you want to do, what you accomplish, what you want to purchase than by showing it? Now, that took us an afternoon, one afternoon. We then brought that VR goggles to the major donors, and we said, we know this is a little awkward, <laughs> it's a little bit uncomfortable, but please, watch this five-minute video. And we put on those goggles, and in five minutes, we accomplished what classically could have taken months of proving to them that there's a plan, proving to them that, the, showing them the dream, showing them the actual opportunities that they have, where this is going to go and where that is going to go. So we brought it, we made it alive with technology. Another sample is let's say you don't have the, the capacity to do that, you can do video books. So instead of creating a 50-page you know, capital campaign book, do a video book. Create that video, put it in, in, into a book. There's, there's so many places where you can do it. Just Google video book. Put that video into a book and let them watch. People want to be entertained today, right? Let them watch what you're, what, what, what you're planning. Now, that's the quiet stage. These are just two... Very simple examples how, so how you can take all the philosophy I just mentioned and put it into practicality. The second thing is the public stage is another element that you, you want to very strongly consider is in this public stage, you know, I mentioned doing a crowdfunding campaign, sure. And I mentioned, you know, um, doing that, you know, that public stage in a much shorter amount of time than doing it in a given day. But at the core of it, what you're looking at is a peer-to-peer -peer strategy. So we talk about peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. There's a lot of debate right now. Is it going up? Is it going down? Some people say it's going down. But it's not going down in the sense of um, reaching out and engaging with your core constituents for them to be ambassadors, influencers for your cause. This is a wonderful opportunity to bring your, if you're a school, to bring your teachers, to bring your parent body, to bring some alumni together to raise on behalf of the organization. And that way is another additional layer of how you can take a public stage that would typically take you months, if not years, into a week's period, a day's time where you have this army of people soliciting for you. So I want to conclude with this. This, you know, this is a very broad um, uh, presentation, not like the other class ones that I've given in the past, probably like nothing I'll give in the future. Because um, what I gave you just now is one simple, one sample of how we can capital campaign in a digital era. And what I'm hoping is that this is going to start a conversation. What I'm hoping is that this is going to open up people's minds and horizons that, hey, maybe we don't have to do it in the way that we've been doing it all these years. Maybe it doesn't have to take so many, maybe the quiet stage doesn't have to take months or years. Maybe the public stage doesn't have to take months. Maybe I can do the public stage in a, in, in, in a, in a crowdfunding campaign. And I really want, my, my hope is that this will open up the horizons and be able to, uh, you know, just plant that seed for everyone in their own way to expedite and to maximize their social equity to maximize their, their, their donor base and to get things done in a more efficient and more leveraged way. So thank you very much. I'm hoping this is going to stir more conversation in the future. Um, if you want to get some um, practical um, services from us, charity.com forward slash capital, and we offer a lot of capital campaign services, um, you can tag us. You can find us at, uh, on all platforms at We Are Charity and myself at uh, Moshe Heck. If you'd like to actually get in touch, if you want to do a free consultation, if you want to 
further this discussion in any way, shape, or form. If you want to um, perhaps get a quote or understand or get a proposal on some of the things that we offer in this regard, please email our client success manager, Jess. So it's J-E-S-S-Q at charity.com. So we're going to open it now over back to Seema and take questions. All right. Thank you, Moshe. Um, so like he said, if you guys have questions, feel free to use the uh, chat box that you see on the left-hand side of your screen. Um, and we have about nine minutes to be exact um, to answer questions. So um, the first one that just came in, uh, Moshe, what happens if you don't meet the first challenge match? How do you regroup? So that's a great question. So you know, the way I answer my clients, what I tell them is I don't set them up for, for not to be reaching that challenge match. Okay? This is not like a decision you make on a, on a Tuesday and then you have to stick to that decision you know, for the next till you, till you execution. Your, your process can evolve over time. So let's say, for example, let's just uh, pick a conservative number for, 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 for argument's sake. So you want to do a $100,000 capital campaign. And you're going to a major donor and you're, you're telling him, you know, I want to raise 25, we need to raise $100,000. I'm asking for you, let's say, for $25,000, right? Um, that that $25,000. Now, um, on the condition that we raise the other $75,000. Now, your next stage is not to just go raise from the crowd. You want to build up that capacity. You want to strengthen that foundation, right? You want to go to another major donor. You want to say, hey, I want 25 from you and do another one and get 25 from them. So what you're doing now is you're creating a foundation of the pillars of community, right? And with that, with those three partnerships, with that foundation of the pillars of community, you're now strengthening your messaging, you're strengthening the bond, the, the, the major donors possibly will communicate with each other, and the, all of a sudden there's buy-in from these major donors. Now you want to go to the crowd for 25%. Now you can plan, today crowdfunding campaigns can be planned, that the chances of failure especially with such leverage um, of that last 25%, in this case $25,000, the chances of failure on a well-oiled planned campaign are so low, it's just astronomically, it's, just, it's, it's, it's so mind-blowing how low that, 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 that case for failure is. And if you still aren't sure, if you don't have enough volunteers lined up, if you don't have enough pre-pledges lined up, if you don't have enough excitement from the, the, from the community, then you need to plan more. It's all about the planning. I always tell people, you know, once your campaign goes live, there's not much you can do about it. It's all in that planning. Now, in the case that you don't reach um, that, that match, well, in times with, in, from the 5,000 campaigns that we've done, there were a dozen campaigns that did not uh, reach their goal. And it surprisingly had a decent effect. So some of them didn't come back. I remember one, we, the organization felt very you know, emotional about this because they, they were so close to their, to, to, to their goal. And they, you know, some of the, this was actually an all or nothing, right? You don't, it doesn't always have to be all or nothing. So it's all or nothing. We launched the campaign two weeks later, and they actually raised 30% above their goal because of that feeling of like, you know, that you know, redemption feeling. Um, so proper planning. You know, this is not like a high-risk uh, Vegas situation. This is about being planning, being efficient, and being well, well you know, creating a well-oiled um, machine. Perfect. Thank you. Um, all right. I, let's see. We have another question that just came in. Uh, what if you don't have a large social media presence? Right. So that's a, it's a great question. Um, so there, there are three, the way I see it is that there are three ways of reaching your community. And there's social media, so there's that whole world. There's you know, phone calls, and then there's direct, either direct email or direct uh, marketing. And I always say that you need to be strong on at least two. Okay? So I've worked with organizations that don't have a social media presence, and we have to double down on those two other elements, which is the you know, phone calls um, and, and emailing. So what we did was we created for their giving day, we planned a phone center. Now, phone centers, may, people may think that they're dead, but they're not actually dead. They're not, as, they're not dead as much as direct mail is not dead because 
a phone center with an integrated plan with email and direct mail, and you're, you know, you're, you're, you're engaging with people on multiple, on multiple um, fronts, and you're giving those an incentive on that, day, on that phone call. You're not just telling them, hey, you know, give to this, this organization. You're saying that you know, we've spent the last 10 months preparing this capital campaign, and we have all these donors that are lined up, and this day your money is going to be matched, and we have this, in time, this time to do it. And again, this is just one sample of how we'd be able to, to do that. Um, then, then being strong on two or three of those um, uh, platforms is what I always tell organizations. And get started. Start building your social media presence. I don't know an organization that cannot gain from a strong social media presence, but that doesn't mean that you cannot strengthen your other means of communication to get things done quicker. All right. Let's see. It looks like we don't have any other questions at the moment. So um, this is your last chance if you guys want to ask anything. Otherwise, I will go ahead. We're almost at time anyway, so I'm going to go ahead and um, finish out the webinar. So thank you so much, Moshe, for your presentation. Um, just so you guys know, we also offer TechSoup courses and TechSoup services. If you guys are interested in taking a course with us, uh, we do have a 10% off uh, for your next uh, TechSoup course of your choice. And Stephen will be sending this out in the email and then also in the chat box to the left-hand side of your screen. Um, we have a few webinars that are coming up. We have one on December 3rd, Getting Ready for an Audit, Everything You Need to Know, December 10th, Social Media 101, and then on December 17th, um, Three Ways to Start a Podcast to Help Your Nonprofit gr Grow if you're interested. Uh, feel free to register using the link that you see here on, on this slide. All right, so uh, before we close out today, if you guys don't mind, we have a post-event survey. So any feedback that you have for us is always really helpful. Um, if you are on social media, feel free to give us a follow on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. And also visit our blog, TechSoup, TechSoup blog, which is at blog.techsoup.org. All right, so I think that is the end of today's webinar. Thank you again, Moshe. Thank you, Stephen, for helping on the back end and to our sponsor, ReadyTalk, and to the attendees.